Good day, my name is Nelson Stone and I'd like to speak to you today about whether or not we can use one biopsy event to identify candidates for focal therapy. These are my disclosures. Prostate biopsies are done about 1.2 million times a year and about 3.4 million times worldwide. There's been a recent decrease in the number of biopsies, but because of COVID and other circumstances, we're now seeing an actual increase in the number of biopsies performed to diagnose prostate cancer. For 2020, we estimate 191,931 new cases, which is about a 20% increase over the last two years, and about 1.8 million biopsies worldwide. The majority of biopsies, 95%, are done as an office procedure by the trust route, and only about 5% are done in the OR, and more recently, by a new office procedure by the transperineal biopsy route. Classically, we treat uh, the whole gland when we talk about treating localized prostate cancer. And that's typically by a radical prostatectomy or some form of radiation therapy. However, we also recognize that the long-term morbidity is substantial with either of these therapies, uh, which has spurred interest in other types of therapy, for example, cryotherapy or high intensity focus ultrasound. These have less morbidity, but they also have a higher local failure rate. The reality is that whole gland extirpation is technically challenging and often not successful. That has spurred interest in focal therapy. Can the treatment of a portion of the prostate give similar oncologic results and improve quality of life? While these concepts are being actively investigated, we need to determine how to identify candidates and which portions of the prostate require treatment. Many of us recognize uh, that we have certain criteria when we want to, excuse me, <coughs> start that slide over. Many of us recognize that we have certain criteria to identify candidates for focal therapy. As this article by Hubner et al. shows, typically we identify patients with a PSA less than 20 or 50, 0 to 15. We, we typically pick uh, patients with a clinical stage of T1C to T2A, and we limit the Gleason score to 6 or Gleason 3 plus 4, and maybe Gleason 4 plus 3 or Gleason gray group 2. Now, the identification of patients for focal therapy is now typically done using MRI, and that's based on the theory of the index lesion being the primary driver for prostate cancer, mortality, and morbidity. And we also now recognize that focal therapy is well tolerated, and multiple studies show it has a lower side effect profile than either prostatectomy or radiation therapy. However, it's important to point out that upwards of 50% of patients can be candidates for focal therapy, and current data shows only a minority of patients are actually receiving focal therapy. And the other thing to point out is when we're talking about the index lesion theory, 75% of men actually have multifocality. In other words, while there may be an index lesion present on the MRI and visible, there is often another lesion typically also clinically significant, at least in grade group two or higher, that needs or should be addressed when considering focal therapy. The physicians from UCLA have done a remarkable job in identifying patients for focal therapy using their MRI fusion biopsy systems. And in this recent study, they looked at a number of patients, so there were over 500 patients in this group, and they used very similar uh, eligibility criteria of less than T2C, PSA less than 20, uh, region of interest on the MRI less greater than or equal to three, and uh, clinically significant cancer as defined by the Leeson Gray groups I previously mentioned. However, they also consider ineligible certain characteristics of the patient that I might want to consider to be eligible. For example, why do we need to limit the Gleason gray group to three and below? Why can't we treat Gleason gray group four or Gleason score four 
if there's a small volume of disease, what precludes the patient from having a focal therapy if it's a higher grade group prostate cancer? And what about bilateral disease? As I previously mentioned, upwards of 75% of men have multifocal disease, and it could be on the other side of the prostate, and we're unnecessarily limiting the number of patients that could be candidates for focal therapy by using these strict criteria. The only real evidence that we need is, can we identify those patients who have disease, say on the left or right of the prostate, accurately and make a decision whether or not they should be treated. This is the uh, flow chart from this particular study. So there were 1,408 patients that entered the study who were candidates for fusion biopsy. And now they eliminated 464 because they did not have a pyras lesion three or greater. So you're limiting those patients, and what about how many cancers are we missing by not actually biopsying them and considering them for potential candidates for focal therapy? And that left them with 914 patients. 460 uh, had a negative biopsy in the region of interest. Now, that doesn't mean they didn't have cancer there. It just means that the fusion biopsy missed it. And if you don't have an MRI area of interest that you can fuse or utilize to select your focal therapy, you can't steer the treatment to that direction. So already we've eliminated over 500 patients from consideration. Now I know all, all of them didn't have prostate cancer, but many of them did, upwards of 30 to 50%. So that left us with the 454 patients that had an interest of re, uh, a region of interest and it had they had biopsy proven prostate cancer. At the end of the day, only 175 were eligible because those are the ones that met the strict criteria, leaving 12.4% of the 1,408 that became eligible for focal therapy. Now, this is an example from their, their uh, publication showing how they identified these patients and what they did. So patient in the block number A on the simulation had a region of interest here in the right posterior of the prostate with three positive lesions for Gleason score seven. So that would be a focal therapy target. The example in patient B had this same region, but they also had two of the systematic biopsies positive. So this would be a uh, hemiablation candidate. And the patient on block C had similar findings, except on the contralateral side, there was Gleason score six, a grade group one, which they would tend to ignore as requiring or needing the focal therapy, and again, limit the treatment to either the region or to that side of the gland. They also had a subset of patients that they were able to compare the MRI findings to with whole mile radical prostatectomy specimens. And you can see in the upper part of the di diagram where you have the whole mounts, the green represents the MRI visible lesion, and the red represents the boundary of the cancer on the whole mount prostatectomy specimen, specimen, and you see here in A, in B it's quite discordant, and in C what the impression was was in the upper quadrant of the prostate, but the reality was it was uh, involving both the right upper and right lower quadrants of the prostate. When you look down here at the their chart, you can see on the specificity side under the column here that the majority of patients were really focal therapy ineligible because they had criteria that didn't meet their requirements, which is the MRI visible lesion and non-multifocality to treat uh, the prostate cancer. I think this, as I said previously, presents a severe limitation in trying to get this type of therapy offered to more patients. And uh, this is, I think, a, an excellent study. Again, it comes from UCLA, where they looked at the capability of MRI to identify lesions. And if we look over here on the right at the multifocality, which is the majority, 239 versus 44 of the patients which had solitary tumors, one can see that when the tumor is less than 0.5 centimeters, 89% of the lesions were missed when the disease is focused. When the disease is multifocal, 
And when one looks at whether or not these were just Gleason sixes or Gleason seven or higher, you can see that between 30, 29 and 38 percent of the higher grade lesions was, were missed when the disease was also multi, also multifocal. This is why you get uh, these type of publications I'm showing you now from NYU, where they did a study of trying to identify the area of focality using an MRI, and they're now talking about Gleason pattern four disease, so uh, Gleason score seven and higher, whether three plus four or four plus three, and they planned out the focal therapy based on the MRI. They did not do focal therapy. They did radical prostatectomies on these patients. And they found 49% of the men had disease outside of the region that where they would apply the focal therapy, which is not surprising given the information I just showed you from UCLA. So how does transperineal mapping biopsy fit into this uh, paradigm of what's the best way to get to uh, finding a patient that has the potential to undergo focal therapy and then know where to apply that focal therapy. So here's an example of a case being done under anesthesia, which where the physician is putting in the needle through the template, similar to a brachytherapy setup. And you see over here on the ultrasound screen, the needle coming in and taking a biopsy of the prostate, which we're looking at in sagittal or longitudinal view. This is, uh, these uh, pictures come from a study we published uh, last year in the Journal of Virology uh, on transperineal mapping biopsies. And one has to recognize that all transperineal biopsies are not the same. And what, what I mean by that is how thorough one does the biopsy, that's the number of specimens of force taken, directly relates to the diagnosis of prostate cancer. So when the patient has a prostate that's longer than the specimen notch of the needle, which is two centimeters. So if the prostate's longer than two centimeters, which it is in most cases, you need to take more than one biopsy in line. So in this example, you see a representation of the biopsy needle and the actual biopsy needle coming in and taking a biopsy from the apex to the mid of the gland. And then immediately following that, the physician will reinsert the needle through the same griddle and then take a biopsy from the middle of the gland to the base of the gland. So the second inline biopsy allows us to have full identification of the, whether there's any prostate cancer along this entire needle tract from base to apex. So this is a study I was just referring to where we, where we termed the number of biopsy specimens taken per cc of prostate volume as the biopsy density, the ratio of number of specimens to cc of prostate volume. And you see it here in the study, biopsy density. And in this particular study, we had patients who were biopsy naive, patients who had prior negative trust biopsies, and patients who had prior trust biopsies that were positive, mostly Gleason gray group one or two that were considering focal therapy. And they had those biopsies done by trust, and now they were coming for a tr uh, transperineal mapping biopsy to better identify whether they were candidates for focal therapy and where the focal therapy should be applied. And what we found was when one uses biopsy density as previously described, the greater the biopsy density going from zero to 0.5 up to greater than 1.5. So that's mathematically, if you have a 40 cc gland, you're talking about taking uh, 60 cores minimum from that specimen. And we can see that the prostate cancer detection rate goes up from 25% to 85%. And now I've plotted this on a regression analysis. The red dots represent the numbers I previously described. The other dots represent uh, multiple studies, well done studies where they reported biopsy tendency in the literature. And this regression analysis is really quite good. The R squared is 0.7. And one can see as we go up in the biopsy density on the x-axis, on the y-axis, we have cancer detection rate, the cancer, cancer detection rate goes up substantially. And when we do a regression analysis uh, and we look at 
the diagnosis of cancer, positive versus negative mapping biopsy, or the diagnosis of cl clinically significant disease is defined by a Gleason score of seven or a grade group two or higher, we can see how biopsy density is significant now. There's no question we will diagnose more Gleason six with a mapping biopsy, but the real issue is, do we diagnose more clinically significant cancer? And the answer is yes. In fact, only age, and we know older men have a higher likelihood of having a higher grade disease and biopsy density were significant over PSA and PSA density in the regression analysis associated with a positive biopsy of clinically significant prostate cancer. So the other, other question is, well, what do you do with this information? And so we also reported that we looked at the number of positive sites, so positive cores or positive specimens, and there was a very good correlation between the number of positive specimens and the likelihood of having a specific type of therapy. So men who had the most cancer got prostatectomy, which is appropriate. Then men who had the second most cancer got radiation therapy. And then the focal therapy patients had about half the number of positive cores as the ones who had prostatectomy. And the men that were eventually put on surveillance had the fewest number of positive cores. This past year at the AUA, we presented a paper, and what we wanted to do is directly compare the transperineal mapping biopsy to uh, multi-parameter MRI to see if we had a better way of finding which patients should have or could have focal therapy and where that focal therapy was applied. And uh, I just want to point out here in this particular study, the mean and median biopsy density was 1.6, which is where we wanted to be in terms of really assessing the accuracy of the biopsy compared to what the MRI showed. Now, in this study, we did not compare the standard MRI fusion biopsy, which takes also 12, 10 to 12 additional cores systematic. We just looked at the ability of MRI to locate the lesions and then compared that to the findings of the transperineal biopsy. So what we did is we divided the prostate into sectors, four quadrants. So this is an example of the mapping biopsy. So the green dots represent the areas where we push the needle. You can actually see the needle right up here, that white flash. And the image on the right is an MRI with an area of interest, region of interest in yellow. And again, the MRI was divided in the same four quadrants. And we compared the two for each of the 60 patients. The MRIs were done prior to the mapping biopsy. And here's an example of uh, the 3D rendition of the mapping. This is proprietary software that was used at both of these centers. And here you can see in this green, this is a Gleason 8 or gray group 4. The yellow represents gray groups 2 or Gleason 7. And, and the blue represents Gleason 6. And here in another center, these circular lesions represent the Gleason gray group two that were found on the mapping biopsy. So let me show you how this all stacked up. On the left, we have the mapping biopsy. On the right, we have pyrads three to five for the same patients. So in the right upper quadrant, there were no positive. This is only in the quadrant, not multiple quadrants, but only in the quadrant. There were no lesions present in the right upper quadrant on the mapping, whereas 3.5% were present on the MRI. Same on the left, 3.5% again on the MRI. In the right lower quadrant, it was 12.5% present only in the right lower, whereas on the MRI, it was 29.8%. The left lower on the mapping was 9.4. On the MRI, it was 31.6. On the right side, so that would be lesions on the top or the bottom of the right, the upper or the lower quadrant, it was 12.5%. And on the MRI, it was 35.1%. Similar on the left. Looking at the bottom of the prostate. So when one talks about hemiablation, it shouldn't be just the left or the right, it could be the lower half. So in actuality, if we're doing mapping biopsy, we found almost 32% of the patients could have a hemi ablation, but the hemi would be on the right and left posterior. 
MRI was 14% on the top of the prostate. So the left or the right anterior was no cases. On the MRI, it was 1.8. Three quadrants on the right was 9.4 versus 1.8 and 9.4 for three quadrants on the right and 1.8 for the MRI. So what this amounted to for the transperineal biopsy was 94% of the patients by mapping biopsy could be eligible for focal therapy by eliminating one or more quadrants of the prostate. Now, when we compare the uh, disease, the uh, test characteristics, we can see that actually the MRI and the standard here is mapping biopsy does not prove to be very good. The accuracy is 53.8% for the uh, entire prostate and it's not substantially better for each of the quadrants. Here we see the area under the curve and most all of them are under 60%. So in conclusion, a single quadrant or hemiablation plan, left or right prostate, as inferred from MRI findings does not correlate with the mapping biopsy results. The most likely hemiablation would be both posterior quadrants. When compared to mapping biopsy, the area under the curve for mapping uh, MRI, for MRI is no higher than 60%. Men with suspicion for prostate cancer can undergo transperineal mapping biopsy as one biopsy event, which would identify candidates and treatment locations for focal therapy. Thank you.